Hi. Thank you for bearing with me. We've been talking about uh, how we acquired this mythology in our mind about what violence does. Uh, there's one phenomenon more that I'd like to mention if you could bear with me, and that is the phenomenon called victim-precipitated homicide, where people often think they're going to defend themselves by flashing a weapon. The minute they flash the weapon, they make themselves more dangerous and they get killed. And it's been calculated that maybe 60, 70 percent of homicides uh, in our country are victim precipitated. That's how they're happening. But there is no victim precipitated homicide in nonviolence. For example, during the Cold War, it was proposed that uh, we should have only completely uh, defensive weapons, and the most defensive weapon of all was what was called civilian based defense, which is completely nonviolent, could not offer a threat to anyone. So let me counter now the three myths of violence with the three realities of nonviolence, which is early on in chapter four, uh, slightly elaborated. The first and most important thing that I'd like to mention is what nonviolence does for the person who offers it. It basically enables us to grow spiritually, and nothing can be more important than that. Uh, recently, I ran across a quote from a Kurdish activist in uh, northern Iraq, in Erbil, who was uh, saying he wanted to have a nonviolent campaign. People told him this is very difficult. They exaggerated that. He said, I know it's very difficult, but you do not lose your humanity in the process. In fact, you actually develop your humanity in the process. So we have kind of developed a rule of thumb here at the Meta Center which is that whatever problem you want to solve, if you want to judge whether you're using the right methods to solve it or not, there's one criterion which is of paramount importance, and that is never degrade a human being. Do, if you throw people in prison, put them in solitary confinement and degrade them, you're doing something wrong. That very fact tells you that your system is operating on the wrong energy. So, first, reality of nonviolence is that it helps the person offering it. The second reality is that it often works, quote unquote, and there have been some spectacular results, some spectacular successes of nonviolent campaigns where violent campaigns have failed. Um, just one example off the top of my head, the Solidarity Movement in Poland. It came at the tail end of decade after decade of violent uprisings of one kind or another against Russian rule, against Russian communist rule, and they all led to disastrous failures. Solidarity, which was basically nonviolent, was a much, much greater success. But thirdly, and even more importantly, even if they don't work, as I was just telling you from the study of Chenoweth and Stefan, even if they don't work, in very important ways, they do good work. Okay, well, I think we're in a very good position now to go on and look at the historical cases that I've chosen for chapter four, which I have chosen to illustrate kind of the array of different situations in which nonviolence can be applied. So that's what we'll be doing next. Look forward to talking to you soon.